during this program, we are going to excite your taste buds. First, the origins of sugar. Then, those of salt. And finally, the action of these substances on the human body. Wheat, with salty, sour, and bitter, is one of the four fundamental flavors. Today, over 100 million tons of refined sugar are consumed annually worldwide. Talk about a sweet tooth. Sugar is a natural compound present in many plants. It is found in some trees, such as the maple, and in some fruits, such as the date. Sugar cane and sugar beets are the only two plants from which sugar can be extracted profitably and on a large scale. 68% of the world's sugar production comes from sugar cane. The remainder, 32%, is extracted from beets. Natural sugar is saccharose. It is composed of a molecule of glucose bonded to a molecule of fructose. It results from chlorophyll photosynthesis. This process occurs in plant leaves through water, air, and solar energy. Saccharose, or sucrose, is used as a guide to measure the sweetening power of molecules of the sugar family. For instance, the sweetening power of sucrose is one, of honey about 1.3, and of lactose, a sugar derived from milk, 0.25. Sugar has an important characteristic. It is highly water-soluble. For example, up to five kilos of sugar can be dissolved in a liter of water at 100 degrees Celsius. Another of sugar's remarkable features is that a sugar solution can be concentrated to the point of supersaturation without crystallizing. All that's needed is to add a sugar crystal to the solution to trigger the crystallization process. The methods used to extract sugar are based on those two properties. To extract sugar from plant juices, physical processes alone are used. One by one, all the other constituents of the plant are removed. Let's look at how sugar is extracted from the sugar beet. Once harvested, the beets continue to live on their own reserves by consuming their sugar. They use 200 grams per ton per day. For that reason, it is important the sugar be extracted promptly. That's why sugar refineries are situated near the cultivation site. First, the beets are washed. They are then cut into thin slices. Slices present a large surface suitable for extracting the juice by diffusion. The beet slices are put into contact with running water at about 80 degrees Celsius. The sugar then spreads through the cell wall of the beet and dissolves in the warm water. Next, the resulting juice is filtered to remove any organic and mineral impurities. To obtain the sugar, all that now remains is to remove the water in which it is dissolved. This is done in successive evaporations in a series of boiling. The syrupy juice is concentrated to the point of supersaturation so it can be crystallized. At this stage, tiny crystals of sugar are introduced into the syrup. They set in motion the crystallization process, which then spreads throughout the solution. Sugar crystals are collected and washed. The sugar obtained is very white and very pure. It goes directly to the consumer and user industries. The process for extracting sugar from sugar cane is exactly the same, except for the first stage. Here, the juice is extracted by a process called granulation. Whereas for the beet, the diffusion method is used. All the other operations to extract sugar from the cane are the same as those used to make beet sugar. 
Sugar can be used to make a great variety of confectionery products. Take, for example, sugar candy made by hand with cooked sugar. These candies are made by combining and cooking sugar and glucose syrup. Crystallized sugar is poured into a hopper. It runs into a copper basin where it is mixed with water and glucose syrup. The liquid mixture is drawn into a cooker and heated at 130 degrees Celsius. The cooked mixture is a doughy batter to which flavoring and coloring are added. are pre-prepared according to in-house recipe. A mixer incorporates them to the batter. The batter is then kneaded by hand on a water cooling table. This lowers its temperature from 130 degrees to 80 degrees Celsius, making it stiff enough to be made into candy. At this stage, the mass of cooked sugar is placed on a roller which progressively reduces the diameter of the sausage of batter, then goes through a sizing roller containing a mold, which shapes the candy. Each piece of candy is finally wrapped by machines to take their shape and delicacy into account. The flavor of sugar and sweets reminds us of our childhood. No wonder, since our preference for things sweet emerges a mere six hours after we're born. While plants have the honor of blessing us with sugar, we owe our salt resources to mines and the oceans. Every year, over 190 million tons of salt are extracted from these solid and liquid deposits. The world's salt resources are inexhaustible. Practically all countries have their own salt bed. The oceans alone contain over 40 billion tons of salt. Salt is a hygroscopic substance, which means it naturally attracts moisture. It has a high water solubility, approximately 350 grams per liter. In a humid atmosphere, salt, water thirsty, will dissolve to form a saturated brine. Conversely, if a brine comes in contact with dry air, the water evaporates and the salt becomes concentrated and crystallizes. This principle is widely used to harvest salt. The best known method of salt production is solar evaporation of salt swamps. solar and wind energy to recover salt from sea water. It is a seasonal activity which requires large expanses of flat earth, impervious to water. Naturally at high tide periods, or by pumping in areas where the tides are insufficient, the seawater is channeled into very large, muddy reservoirs. The water then runs into various shallow ponds to a host of small ducks. Solar evaporation and, to a lesser degree, wind evaporation cause the water to evaporate and the remaining brine becomes more concentrated. In the reservoir where the salt is harvested, saturation is reached, the brine crystallizes out and settles to the bottom. Salt can be harvested by hand during the summer. A kind of rake with a flexible handle is used. is drained and stored in a hangar to prevent rainwater from dissolving it. Salt has always been an important part of man's diet. For centuries, it was used to preserve food. Today, however, man consumes less than 
percent of all the salt produced. Most of the remainder is used by the chemical industry. Salt is the common designation of sodium chloride. It's a chemical compound formed by the association of two ions, sodium and chlorine. Chlorine is mainly used to manufacture plastics, such as polyvinyl chloride. And sodium, with which soda is produced, is widely used in the detergent, textile, and stationery industries. Rock salt, salt that comes from underground deposits, represents two-thirds of the world's salt output. It is extracted from fossil sea salt deposits. Salt rock deposits are found on all five continents. At different times during the constitution of the Earth's crust, the boundaries of the seas and oceans changed. Shifts in the tectonic plates formed vast, landlocked waters. The evaporation of these waters created the rock salt beds now found all over the world. The extraction of rock salt is done by mining. Galleries are dug into the salt layer from a vertical shaft. The galleries are supported by salt pillars. The blocks of salt are crushed and broken. The salt is then ready to be sent to its final destination. Conveyor belts, which are several kilometers long, hoist the salt to the surface as required. Rock salt is unfit for human consumption because it contains numerous mineral impurities. It is mostly used to spread over the roads during the winter. Indeed, salt lowers the freezing point of the water in which it dissolves. It is therefore useful for snow removal purposes. Rock salt is also used to cure hides and skins and to enrich the salt intake of cattle. Rock salt can, however, be purified. It is then called granular salt and is processed by an industrial method, vacuum pan production. The first part of the operation is known as solution mining. Water is forced down one well under great pressure. The salt below is dissolved. The resulting salt brine is forced to the surface through the other well. It is then conveyed by brine pipelines to the refinery. At the refinery, the brine is pumped into powerful vacuum pan evaporators. The evaporators function in groups. Steam from the first pan of boiling brine is used to heat the brine in the second pan, and so on. This method ensures greater energy efficiency. The salt obtained is still moisture laden. It is spin dried to remove the brine. Then it is warm air dried. The salt is then directed to a packaging plant where it is compacted in various forms. Hard salt blocks of several kilos are made for cattle. Salt pellets of a few grams are used to soften water. Iodine and fluorine can also be added to the salt, which is then processed for human consumption. But for most of us, salt remains that marvelous seasoning that adds zest to our food and spice to our lives. The cradles of civilization, such as Egypt or Mesopotamia, are land where salt is abundant. In ancient times, salt, considered a symbol of friendship, was often given as a token of alliance and brotherhood. Today, however, salt and sugar are both a rousing concern. Sugar and salt are essential to maintaining a balanced condition. Sugar, an organic compound, is used mainly as a high-energy food. Salt, on the other hand, is a mineral compound which ensures the balance of our body fluids. Sugar is saccharose. It's a solid, usually white and shiny. It is formed by two molecules bonded together, glucose and fructose. Sugar is digested quickly. It is converted in the intestine by an enzyme. The enzyme splits the saccharose molecule into glucose and fructose. The portal vein carries the glucose and fructose molecules.
the fuel to the liver. They're stored both in the liver and the muscles in the form of glycogen, a more condensed molecule that can be quickly reconverted back into glucose as required by the body. Any sugar that is not stored is sent into the bloodstream to serve as fuel to the various tissues, muscle and brain tissue in particular. Glucose is the common currency of all body cells. With the exception of its effects on tooth decay, a reasonable consumption of sugar seldom poses a health problem. For our biological balance, glycemia, that is the concentration of glucose in the blood, should be in the range of one gram per liter. Glycemia is carefully regulated by the pancreas. Thanks to specialized cells located in the islets of Langerhans, the pancreas produces a hormone called insulin. Insulin ensures that the cells absorb the glucose once sugar has been ingested, the insulin lowers the glycemia to a normal rate. There is, however, a disease associated with sugar regulation, diabetes. This disease is accompanied by an abnormal rise in blood glucose. There are two forms of diabetes. Insulin-dependent diabetes, or juvenile diabetes, is a degeneration of the pancreatic cells that produce insulin. It generally develops in children and adolescents. It requires a lifetime of treatment by insulin injection. The second form of diabetes is non-insulin dependent diabetes or adult diabetes. And it is not due to a dysfunction of the pancreas. Rather, it is associated with disturbances in the cell membrane. These disturbances prevent the insulin from acting normally. The insulin inhibits the cell from absorbing the glucose. As a result, the glucose stays in the bloodstream and causes hypoglycemia. Over three quarters of all diabetics are afflicted by this second form of diabetes. Recent studies show no correlation between sugar consumption and the frequency of diabetes. Until recently, sugar products were excluded from a diabetic's diet. Today, however, that diet is more flexible, and small quantities of sugar are permitted, provided they are eaten during meals. Carbohydrate intake must not, however, exceed 50 to 60 percent of the total calories consumed, as in a normal diet. Salt or sodium chloride is another important part of our diet. Salt dissolves in body fluids to become sodium ions and chlorine ions. Sodium chloride plays an essential role in regulating our metabolism. It helps regulate body fluids, including the blood, maintains fluid and pressure balance within and outside the walls of our body cells. Contrary to sugar, the body does not store salt. A regular and sufficient intake of sodium chloride is therefore needed to maintain our physiological functions as a whole. In a country like France, for example, the average daily intake of common salt is 8 grams per capita. That intake comes from the salt naturally present in foods and the salt added in culinary preparations. Normal blood sodium chloride content is 9 grams per liter. Under the control of a number of hormones, the kidney is its chief regulating organ. The kidneys maintain a balance between salt quantities and water volume. Depending on the body's needs, they regulate salt elimination or retention. Salt helps to regulate blood pressure. However, contrary to popular belief, excessive salt consumption will only cause high blood pressure or hypertension in people who have a genetic predisposition to it. And even
random people who suffer from hypertension are not necessarily sensitive to salt intake. Only 30 to 40% of them need to follow a very low salt diet. Potentially harmful if consumed in excess, sugar and salt are both essential components of a healthy diet. If our taste buds had their druthers, chances are they would never want to give up either of these magic crystals, sugar or salt, because they add so much to our eating pleasure.